welcome to That Thing I Did for a Year, a podcast where we interview fourth year University of Toronto students on interesting experiences they had in a year away from school. My name is Ilya, I'm a fourth year industrial engineering student here at the University of Toronto, and I'll be talking to Andrew today. Uh, joining us for production and the mastermind behind the operation is Arkady Arhangarovsky, a fourth year engineering science student also here at U of D. So as I mentioned, today we're going to be talking to Andrew Kidd. Andrew, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. I am also a fourth year student in engineering science at the University of Toronto, specializing in engineering physics, and just coming off of a year-long PUI experience where I uh, spent just over a year at ZS Associates, working in sales and marketing consulting, and then did a summer internship at McKinsey and Company uh, in more general management consulting. Nice. So lots of consulting. What kinds of experiences did you have before this, like out of school or just professional or otherwise, that kind of led up to this point? Yeah, so, so not much experience professionally uh, leading up to that. I spent a summer uh, volunteering in politics and at a, a think tank. I'm from Ottawa, so politics has always kind of been this big underlying current uh, in my life and in what everyone around me does. Uh, so did that for a summer, went back home and, and just volunteered at a couple different places. And then did a summer of actual real policy work uh, at the Ministry of Health of Ontario. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was helping to develop a digital health strategy for the province, which was cool. But uh, let me experience that government work isn't always all it's cracked up to be. And you get uh -huh. to work on really interesting problems, but that the pace and culture can often uh, not be what you, you are used to coming out of engineering. So the, the turn to consulting came largely because I thought it would be a cool way to still get to work on really challenging and interesting problems, but at a pace that was more in line with what I was hoping for. Nice. Uh, did you kind of experiment with that notion before becoming a consultant professionally, like maybe on campus? Yeah, so that's a fantastic leading question. Uh, on campus, I uh, was fairly involved with the UT Consulting Association for a couple of years as I tried to do exactly that and, and figure out if this consulting thing was right for me. Uh, so in my second year, I was an associate consultant on the volunteer consulting group. Uh, so with a team of other students, did some pro bono management strategy work uh, for a couple of not-for-profits, helping them solve some business problems that they were facing. Uh, and then moving into third year, I was a director of that group, that, that set of teams uh, working with not-for-profits. And then uh, over my, my PUI year away, I was vice president of the, the consulting association. So I had these experiences that let me get a taste of consulting, figure out that I thought it would scratch the itch for hard problems, and also let me work at speed and with interesting people. Nice. Uh, we'll get into this more later, but do you think those experiences were representative of the experiences you had professionally? I would say that those experiences were representative of a small subset of experiences <laughs> I had professionally. And so there's a set of interactions that any of those volunteer things, any of those on-campus engagements can, can capture fairly well. What it's like to actually sit there with a team and have no idea how to solve a problem and start throwing ideas on a whiteboard until you find something that might kind of sort of work. Um, but there's also a lot of it that, that isn't captured. Um, how to work within a, a much bigger consulting firm, how to really manage clients, how to operate in, in complex bureaucracies. There's a whole set of really important skills that just can't be captured uh, within a student group setting. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it gives you enough of a taste that uh, it, it can very much be helpful in, in figuring out if the, the consulting industry, for example, uh, is the right path. Right, okay, that makes sense. So uh, before we get into specific professional experiences, I think for a lot of people listening, like they kind of know what a consultant does. It's like a person who, you know, helps out from outside. But what would you say like a consultant does? Or at least what did you do as a consultant? Yeah, so consulting overall effectively boils down to the idea that companies hire consultants to solve problems that they can't. Uh, maybe that's because the problems are really hard. Maybe that's because the problems are outside their area of expertise. Uh, maybe it's because they just don't want to for whatever reason. But that's consulting as a whole. People often talk a lot about management consulting, which is really an odd mishmash of all the different kinds of consulting. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I say kinds of consulting, I really just mean kinds of problems that a company could hire someone to solve. So HR consulting, technology consulting, uh, strategy consulting, there's a whole set of these. And management consulting is really just the strategic sides of each of those. So not so much helping out with actually implementing solutions um, on the ground, but, but helping figure out how to implement them and what the solution ought to be. Uh, so consulting as a whole is solving problems that companies can't. Management consulting is really solving strategy problems that companies can't. Right. Um, so leading into the first uh, play that you had was 
with ZS, what kind of consulting company would you say ZS is? So ZS describes itself as a sales and marketing consulting company, okay. um, which is, is, is very accurate. It's almost all that they do is sales and marketing. And uh, most of the business is with pharmaceutical companies, uh, which is interesting because it's a very fascinating and highly regulated industry. Mm-hmm. Um, like it's a very strange setting to be in <laughs> pharmaceuticals, uh, especially on the sales and marketing side. Uh, but so most of what ZS does is um, apply analytics uh, to figure out the best way to do sales and marketing. Uh, the company was actually founded by a pair of math professors who came up with a great way to solve in practice the traveling salesman problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was basically the first product and it grew from there to, to capture sort of the rest of, of how you should design your sales team. Uh, and then from there, the natural stepping point is also how should you be doing marketing? Okay, gotcha. What were what was a day like for you at ZS? So um, the standard disclaimer and caveat that yeah. every day is very different. Sure. Uh, but typically, uh, consultants at ZS will work out of their home office. So for me, that was the Toronto office, which is at Bay in Adelaide. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would typically get there seven thirty or eight, which was much earlier than most people. The office really started to come alive around nine. Um, but I would get there, catch up on email. Um, consulting roles in general have a lot of actual like con- client interactions. Um, so I, I would have client emails and internal emails to catch up on. And then I would try to take time to actually just crunch through work. And work in this context um, was one of, of really two things. And the first is trying to find business insights. And that could come from analyzing data. So looking at uh, how much the com- our client had sold to each customer by month over the last three years and trying to identify trends and patterns and where they've been successful and how they can apply that elsewhere. Uh, It might be in evaluating their sales process, so reading through PowerPoints and Word docs, trying to identify potential inefficiencies and ways they could improve it. So whether it's quantitative or qualitative, doing this digging into the actual data and the actual evidence, and then trying to pull out business insights that could help our client be better. Um, So that's sort of piece one, is figuring out what they should do. Uh, Piece two is figuring out how to communicate it. Uh, Mm. And so consultants traditionally will use PowerPoint, but there's also a lot of email and a lot of phone calls involved. Um, So once you have this nugget, this pearl of wisdom, uh, you have to figure out how to actually communicate it so others can understand it and believe that it's true. And so you need to be able to actually explain the evidence behind it. Um, And then those two things basically form a a, a cycle that repeats throughout the day. You'll initially take it, pass it some data, pull out some insights, figure out how to communicate it to your team internally. Uh, And then you'll have a meeting and sit down with them and walk them through it. And then out of that, you'll get maybe a slightly different direction to go in, some interesting new ideas. You'll go back and redo the analysis, figure out how to communicate that. Uh, And after a while of cycling around internally, you'll take it to the client and then the same thing will happen uh, and the process will will never stop. Mm -hmm. Uh, Eventually, at the end of the project, you reach a nice, fully fleshed out set of insights and recommendations that ideally are backed up by some sort of data or evidence. uh, And then that is what you can hand over to the client and start helping them implement and practice. Were you ever around for a project like start to finish? Yes. Uh, so it was one of the beautiful things of the, the PUI experience was that I was there for 13 months. So I saw um, most of my projects through from start to finish. Nice. Um, the first project I was on um, kicked off maybe two weeks before I got there. And then the last, my, the two projects I was working on when I left both wrapped up the week after I left. But in between, I had maybe eight to 10 projects where I saw the entirety. Uh, which is actually fantastic. Getting to see the project life cycle at a company, not just once, but over and over, and mm-hmm. being able to identify what makes certain ones good and what makes certain ones bad is tremendously valuable. What makes certain ones good and what makes certain ones bad, Andrew? So the classic consulting answer to any question is it depends. Uh-huh. And so the answer to what makes some good and some bad is it depends. And there are a, mul- a million different things that, that can feed into whether a project is a good experience or a bad experience. And part of that is... Um, the team internally, uh, which is not to imply that there are bad people, mm-hmm. but sometimes bad combinations of people. Right. There's people that haven't worked together before and need to spend time figuring out how to work with each other instead of being able to leap right into the problem. Um, groups of people who might not have the expertise you would want to tackle the problem. So if you take somebody who has spent their, their entire career working in market research and ask them to optimize Salesforce coverage, 
uh, there will be a steep learning curve, mm -hmm. just as there would be with people who've never worked together before. Uh, and so trying to minimize that learning curve at the start is one thing that makes projects great. Um, another one is just how committed the people on the team are and how the environment on the team is committed to uh, creating opportunities for personal growth and development. Uh, it's one great thing about consulting in general is in an industry where the product is the people, you really have to develop your people or you wind up with nothing to actually sell. So those are a couple of the big internal factors that can figure out if a project mm -hmm. is good. On the external side, it can be as simple as the clients you're working with and whether you enjoy spending time with them and talking to them. Um, I had some clients who would never fail to stress me out any time I communicated with them. And then I had some clients who were, were great people who I would grab beers with um, and like I really enjoyed working with. And then the last dimension is just the work itself and whether it's interesting or not. Right. Uh, so I had one project um, working with a membership association, uh, trying to size the market for, for different products they were thinking of offering. Mm -hmm. So very high level, very strategic, um, worked with, with a big team uh, to, well, a big team of like four, uh, to build a, a model to, to try to quantitatively estimate this, did a bunch of market research, went out and talked to folks in industry to figure out what the market size was for this and figure out where this company should actually focus their efforts, which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Had some projects that were much more, um, you know, trying to figure out uh, where a drug's business comes from in Canada. So I only did two pharmaceutical projects while I was at ZS, mm -hmm. uh, but that was one of them. And so on that one, I loved the team. The team internally was fantastic. I just wasn't all that excited about the work. It was essentially right. just matching together four different data sets in one massive Excel workbook. But the project itself was still fine because if you look at the set of factors as a whole, how great the internal team was and how great the client was made up for the fact that I didn't find the work itself particularly fulfilling. Uh, but so across those three dimensions, you can wind up with good projects or bad projects, but given that there are all three of them playing into it, generally things wind up being uh, fairly solid. There's a, a fairly low variance. Right. And you end up just focusing on the part of it that is more fulfilling to you for that project. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and after having done a couple of projects in pharma, I realized that what was more valuable to me was the chance to learn about new industries with each project, the chance to work outside of healthcare. Uh, and so I started pushing for and got the opportunity to, to spend a lot of time working outside of pharma. So I got to touch financial services, uh, hotels, online travel agencies, uh, manufacturing, affinity membership, like there's there's a long list of these industries that I now understand and got to learn about uh, because of projects at ZS, which is to me exactly what I wanted going into this PUI year. Right. How much clout or how much ability to uh, to influence what projects you're on would you say you had like over the course of both your terms? So for consulting in general, there are four to five different um, dimensions of projects when it comes to like being staffed on projects. You can look at location, you can look at function, so sales versus IT versus marketing. Sure. You can look at industry, so financial services versus pharma, um, who you're working with, uh, and maybe that's all. Let's call mm -hmm. it a four. Generally speaking, you can push pretty hard on one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, exert some influence on another one or two, but you can't really do it for all four at once. Uh, so if you're dead set on working with a particular set of people in financial services, marketing in downtown Toronto, quite unlikely that you'll be able to push your way there. But right. if what you want to do is focus in on financial services and you're much more willing to accept trade-offs on the other three levers, uh, that is very possible. Mm -hmm. And again, it all boils down to the fact that for consulting firms, their product is their people. And so you have to keep your product happy or they will leave. Uh -huh. And a big part of that, a big part of what determines people's job satisfaction in consulting is actually where they're working. Uh -huh. And so giving them at least some choice in that helps quite a bit. So you said this a couple of times, the fact that the product is the people. Explain what you mean by that. How is it that different in consulting versus in other industries? Um, so I will take as an example uh, a theme park. Mm -hmm. which is a fully random example that was plucked knowing nothing about uh, the person hosting the podcast. Um, no. But so <laughs> if you take a theme park, what, what say Disney is selling is uh, the experience and the rides. Uh, and some of that does involve people, right? They're selling the chance to meet Mickey Mouse. Um, but what they are not selling is the expertise of the person underneath the Mickey Mouse costume and saying that that, that is the core of it. Um, if you look at consulting, 
uh, the service that's being offered is the work and expertise of consultants at the firm. So uh, when ZS goes to a client and says, we will optimize your Salesforce coverage, uh, they will then pull out bios and point to the five people who have done this before. Uh, they will point to the analysts who have the quantitative skills to do it all correctly and quickly and cheaply. Uh, and that is effectively what they are selling. If you look at something uh, like, like a manufacturer, they're selling the product the widget, mm -hmm. the life preserver, uh, which is a very strange example to toss out, but they're selling the life preserver and not the folks manning the assembly line who made right. the life preserver. Okay, so th that's an interesting distinction. So you you have a certain set of like technical skills. You're coming out of engineering uh, physics, like, like at, oh, engineering science, like the physics option at the University of Toronto. Does that like directly translate or like how directly does that translate into being a valuable product into being like a valuable consultant? Yeah. So the direct translation was pretty much nothing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the pieces that were valuable to me were more indirectly transferable. So the first one was just having a general quantitative sense. Um, engineers do a lot of calculations and we do a lot of numbers and generally develop a sense of what the output of a multiplication should be roughly. Sure. And it's very valuable to actually be able to look at the outputs of a model or look at documents you're handed by a client and quickly apply a smell test and say, okay, no, something is weird here. We should go look at this more. Um, especially when checking your own work, when building an Excel model, uh, being able to notice if the answer it spits out is wrong can save you a lot of time and hassle down the road if someone else notices that your model is wrong before mm -hmm. you do. Um, the other piece that's really valuable is that a lot of the way engineers approach problems is to first sort of derive the ideal best case, the perfect equation that incorporates everything. You know, derive it from first principles and you get an equation with 16 terms uh, and it's tremendously messy. Mm -hmm. But then the second piece is the valuable one when you go through and you determine which of those terms actually matter and you start throwing things out, making assumptions and approximations that simplify the situation and simplify your analysis until you're left with something that's tangible enough that you can actually work with. Mm -hmm. um, and that is actually really similar to a lot of what uh, consultants do. When you walk into a new project or a new client, uh, you get bombarded with information, whether that the industry as a whole and how it works and what the different players and stakeholders are, or about the client itself. You'll get loads of different data about every part of their operations, and you have to be able to identify uh, which of those are actually worth your time. Mm -hmm. There's never enough time in consulting uh, to do the perfect answer. You want to get as close to the perfect answer as you can in the time you have. But so you have to identify which of those pieces of data, which of those pieces of information you can actually push on uh, efficiently and will get you to the right answer soon. And that's really similar to, to how engineers will try to figure out which of those terms in an equation actually have significance to the final answer. Right. So uh, apart from these quantitative skills that you clearly apply, from what you're telling me, uh, what else is there that you think needs to be brought to the equation when it comes to not only doing well as a consultant, but also selling yourself as an engineer who, for example, in your case, didn't have a lot of uh, previous experience to a consulting firm? Like, what are the things you're kind of selling yourself on? So there's definitely the piece around quantitative and technical skills, and that is actually very valuable and very attractive in business and in consulting. Um, I think that the other two pieces that are valuable are one uh, that engineers tend to have and have been trained with a very structured and rigorous and methodical approach to problem solving. Mm -hmm. um, so even just the fact that we all tend to think in terms of a design process, whether it's the one taught in ESP or the ones taught in Praxis, um, the fact that there is a process, a clear and conscious process we tend to use to solve problems uh, is very valuable and that's mm -hmm. hugely transferable. Uh, and the second piece is, I think, one of the things that comes with saying you're an engineering student is that everyone understands that you know how to work hard and you're willing to put in the hours and, and grind things out. Uh, and while you never want to be doing that in school or at work, uh, especially in professional services, so not just consulting, but professional services as a whole, there are times when you do need to, to put in a bunch of hours and grind something out. And mm -hmm. I think engineering degree is a convenient shorthand for someone who knows how to do that. Right, someone where it's 3 a.m. and they can probably keep going. Exactly. Uh -huh. Gotcha. 
Um, was there anything that you felt you had to prove you were not? Was there any like perceived weakness you had to kind of like prove you didn't have um, in general or as a consequence of being an engineering student? Yes, yeah, so I think the, the big one from engineering was uh, trying to prove that I had the social skills to be allowed to interact with clients. Gotcha. Um, and so I think that uh, the stereotype of a lot of engineers, especially those who don't have a degree yet, who have limited professional experience, um, is that, you know, great with the numbers, but might not be the best at interacting with the client, might not be able to grasp uh, some of the nuances of the situation and understand how to be positioning things to achieve buy-in from the client side. Um, and so I made sure in my, my first few weeks at, at both of the places I interned uh, to make sure to be doing all of those things in the internal meetings, uh, to be using our internal touch points and check-ins as my client meetings, uh, to demonstrate that I had those skills so that when opportunities actually arose for me to go and present in front of clients or to lead and facilitate workshops, uh, that I was actually trusted to be able to do that. So that was the, the big weakness that had to be overcome. Uh, I think the other, the, the smaller and less consequential one was just a lack of business context and business vocabulary and terms. Uh, I got asked at one point what a contribution margin was. Uh, I think it was during a case interview where I was helping someone else prep for case interviews. Uh, and I still don't really understand what a contribution margin is. <laughs> um, but it's very easy to find out because all you have to do is Google it. And over time <laughs> from working in consulting, you pick up on a lot of the jargon uh, just because someone uses it and you pull out your laptop and Google it and you, and you figure it out. So that's a, a much more surmountable difficulty, but it was still a, a gap that had to be filled for me. Right. Let's do that. So uh, you mentioned case interviews, and that kind of leads into the next thing I think uh, I want to talk about and a lot of people might want to hear about. There's a ton of just like mystique and like a lot of people talking about what the consulting interview process and kind of like recruiting process is like. So you've gone through it a couple of times, I would imagine also quite competitively in the lead into working at McKinsey. Um, could you give like a brief rundown of what that whole thing looks like? Sure. So... Uh... Setting aside the consulting firms that do PUI, because um, there don't tend to be many of them, and they operate on the regular PUI time frame. Mm -hmm. uh, outside of that, consulting companies will hire for full-time and for summer internships. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, they're looking for those summer internships for folks who are in their summer before their final year. Uh, but so what the timeline looks like for that is in uh, September, uh, they will be recruiting for full-time roles for the next September. So in September, your fourth year, you would be recruiting for full-time roles to begin in September after graduation. And then in December and January, consulting firms will recruit for summer internships uh, for the, the following summer. So in December, January of your third year, you'd be uh, recruiting for a summer internship to happen between your third and fourth years. In terms of what those processes look like, for most firms, they're actually almost identical. Um, generally speaking, two rounds of interviews uh, both of them containing a behavioral aspect, which will be roughly similar to the behavioral interviews you'll see elsewhere. Although in general, consulting firms prefer to drill down on a smaller set of experiences and go deeper and ask a lot of probing questions to actually identify what you were doing and what impact you had and what decisions you made uh, instead of a, getting a broader set of experiences without that deep understanding. Um, so behavioral interviews, but a bit more concentrated. And then the second piece is the case interview which essentially boils down to trying to solve a business problem together with your interviewer. Mm -hmm. And it's what consulting firms will use to evaluate or try to evaluate problem solving skills, some communication skills, uh, and some uh, sort of business understanding skills. Uh, in general, two rounds of interviews, two to three interviews in each round, uh, and both rounds of interviews generally will cover both behavioral and case. Uh, and that is generally true across consulting firms as a whole. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Is there a specific or a different way to prepare for consulting interviews or like that you use that you find useful? Yeah. So the case interview is really weird. Uh, <laughs> and to walk into a case interview never having prepped for one um, is not generally a great idea. Um, so in terms of prepping for case interviews, I think that the best way to do it is to watch a couple examples on YouTube just to get a feel for this genre and what it is and what the expectations of both sides are. And there are a lot of great examples on YouTube. Uh, and then to find friends to start practicing with. There are loads of great case books online 
uh, American MBA programs, uh, their consulting clubs tend to produce awesome case books just filled with cases you can use to practice. So grab some friends who are also interested in consulting, grab a couple of these case books and go work through some cases, doing them as mock interviews. Um, try to pull in for help where you can. Folks who work in consulting or have interned in consulting who, who know what a good case interview looks like and can, can help you there and provide good targeted and tangible feedback. Uh, but work through cases with friends. Some folks will say that you shouldn't walk into an interview unless you've done at least 50 or at least 100 practice cases, uh, which I think is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, like I was an engineer, there was no way I had time to do 50 practice cases. So I did like 10 to 15, made sure that each one I, I did, I actually put effort into and thought about and took meaningful feedback away from. Uh, but I think that that is, is the best approach for cases. For behavioral interviews, the best advice I ever got was... Um, to actually try to think of some sort of meaningful experiences to you, whether professionally or in extracurriculars or in academic experiences, uh, some experiences that, that are ones you would want to talk about in an interview to demonstrate the impact you've had, and actually sit there and take 10 minutes and walk back through them in your head so that you can remember the details and who was involved and the timeline and who said what and who did what, so that when you are in the interview and being asked these probing questions, uh, like, okay, well, so why did you choose to say that? Or... You say you convinced him of this. What did you say to convince him of this? Mm -hmm. uh, when you're being asked those probing questions, you don't want to have to be trying to remember on the spot or even worse, trying to make things up on the spot because that's never a good idea. But so if you've actually taken the time to go back through and relive that experience, you'll have the answers at your fingertips and your focus can be on how to actually present it uh, in the best light for the interview. So that, that to me are, are the two pieces of prepping for consulting interviews understanding what a case interview is and then working through practice cases with friends. And on the flip side, making sure you're comfortable talking through some of your more meaningful experiences in prep for the behavioral portion. Nice. So uh, a lot of like this kind of intense process is uh, something that's applied to the company that you worked at uh, in the summer, which was McKinsey. So was working at McKinsey significantly different from working at ZS? And like, what was the contrast between those companies? Yeah, there were some uh, sort of surface level differences that still have a big impact on the overall experience. So for example, at ZS, consultants will generally work out of their office uh, unless there is a meeting or a need to, to travel to the client site. So the, working out of their office mean like they were working like in their office and like, like going to the client when necessary. Exactly. So so day to day, I went to the ZS office and worked there. Most of my team was there. And when needed, we would travel to the client site to, gotcha. to present to them. At McKinsey, it's really the other way around. Uh, most McKinsey teams, and this is true for a lot of the big consulting firms, will work on client site by default. Mm -hmm. uh, Monday through Thursday is typical. So folks will be uh, with their teams at their clients Monday through Thursday, and then back in their home office on Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means that you actually you get less exposure to a lot of your colleagues, like the other consultants, but it does let you build much deeper relationships with your clients just because you're seeing them that much more, you're grabbing lunch with them, you're sitting next to them. Uh, so that's a very interesting trade-off that had a big impact just on what the day-to-day -day was like. Um, the other big one that's, that's obvious until it isn't is that McKinsey has a broader scope of work. Uh, but what that means is you are much more likely to be working on things that you've never worked on before and mm -hmm. that are much further away from what you have worked on before. And that, again, can be good and bad, right? It, it makes it a bit harder to build expertise uh, in a field because you aren't going to walk in and immediately do three projects in a similar space just because there are so many more projects that you could get staffed on. Uh, but it can also be great because it means that your learning curve will not flatten until you want it to. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can continue just learning about new industries and new functions and new project types um, for a much longer period of time. In terms of the, the less superficial stuff, looking at the cultures, I was actually really surprised by how similar the cultures were, um, which, which does make some sense when you stop to think about it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, both firms are trying to recruit smart people uh, who can solve problems, but also are good to spend time with because consultants mm -hmm. often will work long hours together. And it's nice to do that with people you actually like. Uh, and so while there are some differences in terms of the schools they recruit from and the, the profiles of people interested in each firm, if you go into it with those criteria, the people who come out the other end are going to create a really cool and fun and exciting culture. 
uh, at ZS, it's a bit more spread out because you're with people all the week. So there are, you know, a couple things happening per week on different days, uh, whether it's office trivia on Fridays or, you know, grabbing drinks for someone's birthday on a Tuesday. At McKinsey, it tends to be more concentrated because everyone is only back in the office on Fridays. Um, so there are more things will just happen on those Fridays and they feel much more intense. Uh, but the, the core aspects of the culture are actually very similar. Right. A lot of the things that are heard, not just about consulting, but just like the, like the business services, professional services, like just I guess financial and business industries in general, is kind of the, well, for lack of a better term, schmoozing side of it, uh, where you're like supposed to be like very, very social with like either the client or your teammates. How much truth is there to that? Or like what was your experience with like the social side of things? So I think that that definitely is something that's present, but especially on the internal side, I really, really liked everyone who I met and worked with. So nice. it never felt like schmoozing. Uh -huh. um, after, right after I finished my summer internship, uh, most of the interns had one week left. A bunch of us went off to a cottage in Innisfil for a weekend uh -huh. just because we liked each other and liked spending time with each other. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, cool, let's go do a cottage weekend. Yeah. So I guess technically that counts as schmoozing and building relationships in the firm that will be useful down the road. But it never felt like that because it felt just, exactly yeah. spending time with people you mm -hmm. like spending time with, uh, and obviously there are some cases that are a bit uh, less obvious like that. But even I, I grabbed coffee with a couple partners over the course of my summer, and that's an interaction that could feel very schmoozy. Mm -hmm. But all of them seemed to actually care about me genuinely, and we had like real conversations about the work they did and the professional decisions they've made. Uh, and so I think that that accomplishes the goals of the schmooze, builds relationships, lays a foundation for professional success. Uh, but even though I am like a fairly shy guy at heart, uh, none of that ever felt forced. Nice. That's great. In terms of dealing with clients, um, I think it, it can be a bit trickier. You've got to be a bit more willing to put yourself out there because uh, clients are often very different than, than consultants. Uh, mm -hmm. And Oftentimes, the schmoozing with them is a core part of the job as opposed to a, an extra thing you would do uh, on the side like it might be internally. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, the people who can, the companies that can hire consulting firms uh, tend to be, I don't want to say reasonably successful, but successful or sizable or uh, historical companies like like there's a reason that they're big enough to be able to afford consultants mm -hmm. and that generally means that their people are pretty good and that generally means that their people are not uh, horrible and miserable folks who you wouldn't want to grab dinner with after uh -huh. work uh, but I'd say that overall that the schmoozing side internal and external was a fairly small piece of my experience at both firms it was one that was there it was one that I mostly enjoyed which surprised me as an introverted shy dude um, but overall it was not a big determinant of my, my experience at either firm. Nice. From a, like, like coming back to school after having done consulting, like did it change your perspective at all on what you'd want to spend time on or on the decisions you make? So a little bit in that, um, I think I have more free time in my fourth year than I would if I hadn't done the year in consulting. Um, because if there's one thing that consulting teaches you, it's how to quickly structure and break down problems, identify what needs to be done and what doesn't need to be done, mm -hmm. and then push through and just do it. Uh, so I find myself working much more efficiently, uh, especially in teamwork uh, settings and design courses. Uh, so I think that it's generating more free time for me. In, in terms of the actual question you asked, right, which was, does it affect how I'm spending time? I'd say not really. Um, I still try to spend a bunch of time with friends and people I like. Um, I try to make sure that I am, you know, contributing in these extracurricular organizations I'm part of and, and mm -hmm. using those as a chance to make this place a bit better. Uh, but I think I would have tried to do that without consulting. Right. Gotcha. Um, do you think you'd want to return to consulting as an industry? So I think if I'm going to go get a job in industry, it's going to be in consulting. Mm -hmm. um, I loved the chance to continually be learning about different industries and different functions. Uh, the piece that really sold me on it was the idea that you only ever get to work on the interesting part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you'll come in and you'll help a client figure out what the solution to their problem is. Or you'll come in and you'll help a client start to implement the solution and you're there for when the going is tough and things are difficult and challenging and there's a lot of meaty problems to try to solve. 
But as soon as things get easy and simple and you know, you're into just the day-to-day -day execution, the client is not going to pay for consultants to sit there and babysit them. And so right. you're off that project and you've got to go do the interesting part of another problem. Um, and so all those things together mean that consulting is where I'd want to be if I'm in industry. Still trying to figure out if I want to go get a job or if I want to do grad school. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned politics was always this thing that's been around me. So the idea of doing some sort of grad work in economics or public policy, uh, maybe public affairs or global affairs is, is really cool and interesting to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's really the other option on the table. All right. That's, that's dope. Um, I know a lot of uh, consulting firms generally tend to be like decently young. Like they take a lot of people out of school and kind of keep them. Um, how, in your view, does that like work with the fact that these firms are ultimately selling people and like expertise? Like, uh, how do you think you were able to gain enough expertise for it to be a product as somebody who hasn't been in the industry much? Yeah, and I think you've identified one of the core tensions that is shifting how the management consulting industry works right mm -hmm. now. Um, and that is that a lot of clients are asking exactly that question. Um, why should I be paying you to send me a 23 year old person who has never held a quote unquote real job? <laughs> um, and so I think that the way that firms are addressing that is uh, by emphasizing what those young kids do actually bring to the table, which is uh, generally speaking, great analytic skills and not necessarily quantitative, right? But just overall in terms of breaking down and solving problems, um, fresh perspectives, uh, ties in to the new uh, thought that's coming out of, out of a lot of universities, right? The way that um, the cutting edge and academia thinks about a lot of problems is very different than the way industry thought about them 10 years mm -hmm. ago. Um, but then you can supplement that and try to uh, address the weaknesses those people have around a lack of actual experience in industry um, in two ways. And both most firms are doing both ways. One is actually to hire and experience people from industry to play key roles on project teams. Mm -hmm. uh, and so all of the firms are making way more experienced hires than they used to from other firms to some degree, but largely from industry. So in looking to build out a practice in financial services, trying to, to hire in people who actually have experience on the ground in financial services, who can um, couple that experience with the fresh perspectives and, and hotshot analysis mm -hmm. uh, of the, the kids coming in the door. And then the other way is um, building out expert networks. Uh, so there are some third-party vendors that will do this, like GLG, uh, or I think the other one is Expert Now. Um, but firms will also build out their own set of experts. So, you know, a retired head of a New York ad agency who agrees to, you know, spend a few hours a month just talking to McKinsey teams and, uh, you know, filling them in on how the industry works, mm -hmm. letting them road test ideas. Uh, and, and so that also is a tremendously valuable uh, piece that, that a consulting firm can bring to a client and say, hey, look, yes, our core project team might be young and out of school, but look at this vast array of expertise that they can tap into uh, based on whatever your problem requires. Um, and then the last piece I'll point out is that it's actually fairly recent that uh, undergrad hires are driving most consulting firms. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still a lot of folks coming out of MBA programs uh, that, that play a big role at most firms. And uh, they almost always have significant work experience from before their MBA that often is quite relevant to whatever they wind up doing in consulting. And so that's one other source of experience and expertise uh, that can kind of offset some of the weaknesses that the undergrads have. Gotcha. Uh, did it ever, uh, I, I don't want to bother you, but like, I, I don't know, I, I worked a consulting job for eight months and like one, one of the things that I found bothered me was that we were there for like the very interesting part of the problem, like the meaty part of the problem, but once the going got easier and more procedural, like we leave and we never really get to like build the thing. Um, did, did that ever like, like strike you or were you like happy working on like just like the problem as a sign? Interesting question. Um, so I think that it did bug me uh, a couple times, right? You come up with what you think is the perfect solution. You see your client struggle in trying to, to implement it. You help them over the bumps um, and then you're gone. And I think that it's not necessarily that you never see the thing at the end of the day, because ideally you've actually built relationships with your clients and you stay in touch and you get to 
to go tour the new facility mm -hmm. or, or look at the new organization. Um, but the fact that you have no ownership or responsibility for the thing can be kind of frustrating mm -hmm. uh, because you've put so much time and effort into getting it to, to where it was when you left. Um, but to me, weighing that feeling of satisfaction versus what I think the next six months on that project would have looked like uh -huh. is a trade-off that, that made me happy to, to go do something else. Um, and so I definitely think that there is, it's one of the negatives of consulting is that you don't get to be the operator and you don't get to carry things through to the finish line. But uh, that can often involve a lot of work that I don't consider interesting or that I don't find interesting. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to sacrifice that chance to be the operator uh, for the chance to do work that I find more interesting, if maybe slightly less fulfilling. Mm -hmm. If you end up not being in the consulting after school, could you see yourself going back to it like as one of those people with expertise, like as not the, just the hotshot analysis, like analysis heavy undergrad, but like that dude who has a lot of experience and say public policy? Thank you for calling me a hotshot. I'm not yeah. sure if that's a deserved compliment. Uh, uh, so, but, so, uh, uh, so I, I think so. Um, I think that especially in that role, um, the chance to just solve interesting problems and to help others solve interesting problems uh, would be both valuable and fascinating. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've taken out of the extracurriculars I've been involved in is that I really, really like helping others be successful and coaching others on how to be better leaders or problem solvers or event planners. Mm -hmm. um, and so the dynamic that you get a lot of the time with those experienced folks in a consulting firm where they are sort of helping others think through how to tackle the problem and, and how to learn about an industry or a function uh, is one that I think I would enjoy. So I don't know exactly what sort of career path might take me to get sure. that much experience, but I think that being in that position and sitting there uh, would be a pretty cool time. Right. That's cool. Um, what would you say to people who want to get involved with consulting like out of undergrad? So I'd say that um, you should try to get some experience in it first to figure out if it's something you actually enjoy. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot of avenues to do that, and we've touched on most of them, mm -hmm. uh, whether it is getting involved with pro bono consulting programs on your campus, whether it's going to talk to folks in consulting, reaching out to alumni or folks you know uh, at consulting firms, whether it's doing some case competitions, which are fun and also kind of representative of what consulting is like, uh, or doing internships in the field. Get some taste of this consulting thing before deciding to, to leap right in with both feet. Um, but other than that, I think consulting is an awesome first job out of undergrad. The set of skills and experiences it gives you are very hard to get elsewhere. Uh, and so in general, I encourage people to, to quite seriously consider consulting as, as the path for them. Right. Uh, just one thing I'll add on to that is even if you don't see yourself as a consultant in undergrad, uh, like after undergrad, which is like the position that I find myself in, I think the consulting internships are so, so valuable just because you get to touch so many different things. And like, so I guess to echo your point, good way to learn regardless of the kind of thing you want to get into. Uh, so that brings us close to the end of our time. Was there anything else you wanted to say or anything else you wanted to talk about um, here? So I guess the only other thing that I will do um, is make a plea for folks to, to get involved outside of the classroom, both from a consulting perspective and from a general university student perspective. I think um, that some of the most rewarding and fulfilling experiences possible that can help you get into consulting, but also just are great in and of themselves, are actually getting involved with, with non-academic experiences. Mm -hmm. So I've done a stupid number of extracurriculars while I've been here. Ilya has done roughly as many. Um, but I think that it's something that, that helps a lot professionally, but also it helps you figure out what kind of person and leader and worker you are. And that's really valuable. Uh, so check out clubs fairs, check out um, student society websites with club lists, but it's definitely worth getting involved. Uh, other than that, Thanks to Ilya and Arkady for the invite. This was a lot of fun. Sweet. Uh, I think the last question I have for you is if people want to like reach out to you or if yep, they just have questions and whatnot, where can they find you? Sure. So uh, the name is Andrew Kidd, K-I-D-D. I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I spend most of my life in the engineering science common room. Uh, feel free to hit me up on any of those three platforms <laughs> and I'm always happy to chat.
Uh, sweet. Well, thank you for chatting with us. Uh, this has been That Thing I Did for a Year. We'll see you next time.